sadly no snow in Florida, but it sounds like some people got some amount of snow in a lot of different places. So that's great. <laughs> wow, that's quite a variety of uh, weather out there. So that's great to see. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, thank you for attending um, and joining us today at the ACRL Digital Badge Interest Group Fall Webinar. Uh, my name is Emily Rimland. I'm a librarian at Penn State. I'm the founder and current convener of the interest group. Our webinar today is titled Libraries and Undergraduate Research, Exploring Digital Credentialing and Co-Curricular Programming, and we'll feature two great speakers, um, which I'll introduce momentarily. Um, a few things first. If you haven't attended one of these before, you're not familiar with our group, um, we'll give you some ways to contact us. And first way to contact us is you can just reach out to one of the conveners of this group. We have a more of a convener team, I would call it, as you see here. Um, listed on the slide is everybody um, on that convener team. Um, I already introduced myself. Wendy Pothier is here. She's our incoming convener. Uh, Tori Raish um, is a past co-convener. She's my colleague at Penn State. And then also Kelsey O'Brien is a past convener and she is here as well. Um, those folks are moderating the chat and the Q&A. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out uh, directly to them or to us after this program. Um, as far as further resources, um, there's lots of ways you can connect with us. Um, listed on this slide are just some of those ways. So we have a listserv, which some of you may already be on, but you're welcome to join. Um, you can also join the interest group, which is a free um, add-on to your membership through ACRL. Um, you can also get on, get in touch with us with uh, ALA Connect. And then you see there we have a uh, digital badge interest guide, LibGuide, or interest group LibGuide. Um, which is linked there and there's a discussion section. There's different resources there. If you want to look at past presentations and webinars we've had through the group, they are listed there as well. We'll put the recording um, and information about uh, this webinar up there as soon as we have it. Um, if you're interested in contributing a blog post, um, hearing about a specific topic, learning more about a specific um, topic within micro credentialing, um, please absolutely feel free to reach out to us um, in one of these ways and let us know um, about that. Um, just a few housekeeping things before I introduce our speakers and we get things underway. Um, probably many of you are well versed in these kind of housekeeping things, but just as a reminder, uh, please remember to mute your microphone if you're not speaking. Um, please ask your questions via the chat. And um, Wendy is moderating that for us today. She will acknowledge you. And we plan to do a Q&A pause between our two speakers and then at the end of the webinar. So you'll have um, opportunities there to ask, have your questions asked and answered. Um, there's also a live transcript of the discussion that's available. If you click on the live transcript button, that should be in pretty much the center bottom um, part of your Zoom window. Um, that should bring up the panel with the live discussion. Uh, live transcript for you. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers for today. Um, we're happy to have these two guests here with us today. Our first speaker is Mark Zaldivar. Um, Dr. Zaldivar is currently the Director of Professional Development Network in Teaching Enhanced Learning and Online Strategies, or TELOS, at Virginia Tech. He has worked in various departments and programs at Virginia Tech since 1993, including teaching and is primarily has a primary focus on transformative education, as well as language, student engagement and critical reading and writing skills. And our second speaker today is Amanda McDonald. She's the undergraduate research services librarian at Virginia Tech. Um, in her role, she serves as the liaison to the Office of Undergraduate Research the Honors College, and the Departments of Human Development and Biological Sciences. Her work and research focuses on creating openly accessible resources to support students and faculty engaging with formal undergraduate research experiences. She coordinates the Advanced Research Skills Program for University Libraries and is deeply involved in the university's Undergraduate Research Excellence Program. So those are our speakers for today. I'm going to stop my share. And I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Mark, over to you. 
Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm Lynn. Thanks for the invitation and a chance to get to speak to you all. I'm going to share my screen right now. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. Good. Okay. Thank you. Wow, there's a bunch of folks here. I really appreciate the crowd. <laughs> this is um, a good topic. And, and thanks again for the invitation. I, I know we've been uh, working at it at Virginia Tech for a while, and I, I love to come do these kind of presentations. And I'm going to try to uh, speak really quickly and just kind of give the big picture of Virginia Tech on sort of who we are and what we've been doing with badging at, at, um, over the last you know 18 months or so. Um, where we're going, and then I'm going to sort of get out of the way so that Amanda can show you uh, sort of the de uh, details of a really good project. If you're not familiar with Virginia Tech, we are sort of a big and diverse place. Uh, we are a research one institution, uh, lots of majors and options, and, and I like to sort of put all this info up there. We are a very diverse campus, and we have, uh, like a lot of research one institutions, a very college-based uh, organization around where we are. Uh, hardly anything gets done the same way twice at Virginia Tech, which makes uh, innovations like badging very interesting to try to get out you know, across the university. And it makes you know positions like Amanda and ours, where we don't work directly in classrooms a lot of times, or, or you know, we're not primary instructors. We work as sort of support organizations to help try to get these ideas, uh, both teaching and uh, technology ideas out. So it's, a, it's an interesting place to work for sure. Um, I specifically, as Emily mentioned, work within Telos. And, and Telos is nestled within information technologies. Um, our primary interface is between IT and the academic side. So we focus on academic technologies. We support Canvas, our learning management system, and several other platforms like Zoom has become a very popular one <laughs> this year uh, on campus. And try to not only sort of support the technology side, but help best practice deployment to help sort of make sure faculty and students are getting best experience out of all these tools. My particular group within Telos or the Professional Development Network, I focus primarily on working with faculty to develop, you know, uh, training events. We host almost 300 events a semester. Um, we actually just wrapping up the semester had about 3,000 seats filled. So we were happy in that sort of, again, working mostly with partners around campus like Amanda and others in the, in the library and, and other groups to try to offer sort of a broad range of uh, not only technology training, but sort of where to put that technology. And that's sort of the broad foundations of, of sort of why we had badging as part of what I've been working on. And I like to kind of frame that, and I've been talking about this sort of in other contexts as a history of year ones, um, because I actually about to see 2008, I began working with uh, electronic portfolios at Virginia Tech. And in about 2011, I think was some of our earliest conversations about badging, uh, mostly coming in through the work we were doing with portfolios, but the digital technologies that were supporting them were just beginning to start to emerge then. Uh, there were other universities that were interested in using them. So we had a, you know, started then with, with a company. I think we were on the scholar learning management system at that point. Um, we have started and stopped and started and stopped uh, over and over. Uh, luckily, about a year and a half ago now, um, when Instructure sort of emerged, our uh, Badger became the sort of primary uh, badging tool for Instructure. Our campus is very Canvas based, like so much is happening there. They kind of gave us that last sort of leverage step into like, okay, we have a platform and we have a, a mode to do it. And nicely, we had sort of the avenue of working with the professional development groups to kind of give us that early um, leverage. So things we learned from all those early uh, so we'll call them missteps, we'll call them early starts. Um, we really needed partners. You know, I think a lot of times uh, early on, there were just two or three people, uh, myself included, who were driving this innovation, who were interested in it. Um, it really sort of took a, a couple of um, you know, evolutions of the technology and of uh, how and why people would want to use that technology to start giving it the legs underneath the project. And, and I can't really stress you know, more that we didn't really have a place to put it. This was an interesting evolution of the portfolio technologies in our perception at that point. Uh, we really didn't see what it was worth on its own. And as it kind of you know, evolved and the badging technology and the uses in badging and, and so many different contexts evolved, we started seeing how we could really apply it to, to particular issues and things we were working on at Virginia Tech. So that really gave us a lot, a lot of success. 
so I call it year one again. <laughs> and so this was 2019, the beginning of the academic year 2019, which really seems like 12 years ago at this point. It's hard to believe that it's really only been that long. Um, but we really began sort of anew uh, as, as we focused on it and things that we really uh, sort of worked successfully. Uh, as we began to really look at the integration of badges with our learning management system, that started several conversations around campus of people that were just interested in deepening their use of the learning management system. Better ways to offer both courses, better ways to do tra professional training. We uh, actually started a second Canvas instance at Virginia Tech around the same time that was devoted only to professional development. So we have Canvas for students and we have Canvas for faculty development. That you know, is where the badges sort of first popped their head up and that gave us a really good platform and a way to start talking about how badges can work um, for uh, learning. A lot of good partnerships through the professional development network really allowed us to find leverage into several different professional development groups that were interested in badging. I put the graphic over there on the side. That's just a graph of sort of everything from the first year. So you can see how many different groups are giving badges. Those top two especially are primarily professionally development focused. Uh, the big surprising one, the capital assets and financial management uh, began a huge curricular development um, effort at the early stages of 2019 with the charge of certain kinds of training that had to go to all fiscal agents at Virginia Tech. She needed a lot of help with Canvas and nicely we started doing badging as ways to kind of indicate progress through all of that curriculum. People started putting the badges on their email signatures and it started drawing a lot of attention to sort of what is this badge thing? And she's given out almost 3,500 badges in the last year, so uh, very busy. And you see our number third that um, Amanda will be talking on there is the university libraries and how that what they've started working on as well. So that partnership really helped, uh, as I said, as we started uh, working through the year to continue to work with the library uh, on how we can move it from only faculty professional development, but also to student professional development and ways in which we can bring it down to that undergraduate crew. So it's been pretty successful. We've had a lot of good results. There's a bunch of our badges, you know, and so they, they look like all sorts of different things. But the, the big success I feel like that I'm seeing is now we're about you know, 18 months into this project is that it's holding, uh, that we're continuing to grow and, and gain interest in other projects, uh, that it's the kind of technology that the groups become self-maintaining and so they uh, grow and expand into other groups that are nearby. Uh, all that sort of seems that, that it's working really well. I was checking this morning and we have 19 official groups at Virginia Tech that are giving out badges. We have 189 different badges being offered in our public catalog, and we have 16 different pathways, which I didn't really talk too much about, but that's something that Badger and a lot of the other badge platforms offer, which is a way to sequence badges into significant pathways. And I think that also has really given us a way to not make these just interesting things that you can attach to something, but intentional parts of curriculum, right? We can sequence badge earning to sort of get people through all these different steps. So we've had some really good success with our pathways. Uh, we have badges popping up everywhere. Like I said, and a lot of what I've been working on is just consulting with different groups on best practices, ways that they can do this. By far the most popular, a lot of times that initial conversation comes from completion badges. Um, things like the inclusive climate program, which you can take a series of online workshops, some of them are self paced, some of them are discussion based and face to face. But once you complete a set of requirements, you are rewarded with an inclusive climate badge, or the spotter and lantern fly uh, quarantine training, <laughs> if I got that right, uh, which is actually offered to extension agents uh, around the, the state, um, sort of for state level certification. So sort of all different levels of completion and certification. Uh, we also see a lot with steps of learning, and I put the star badge up there uh, just to kind of, when we first started, I think there was a lot of emphasis on high quality badges only. How do we build the best badges only? I think as I've started maturing in my understanding, I, I, you start to see this whole ecosystem of badges. And what I start to call little badges or the steps of learning badges really have their place. And that's what the inclusive climate, for instance, has a bunch of requirements that lead up to this larger completion badge. Those little badges are also skills worth noting. And we see a lot of ones like this one, the historic preservation, they have 
six different topics in housing and development that people can take professional development in. When they get three, they get a final certificate. And that's a really nice sort of small step along the way. Uh, we also see a lot for award winners and honorifics. A lot of times that's an early conversation. Uh, we had the opportunity in March, of course, like everybody else, and moving all of the curriculum online in a very short amount of time. And it required a very large amount of help from a network of people around the university. So Telos partnered with um, faculty from across the university who had technical skills and, and uh, design skills for instruction that could help all of our faculty get online. And we were nicely able to sort of do things like give a badge to those that were able to help and begin to sort of create that community around the continuity partners. So that's what I'm really liking to see with badges is that they begin to fit into areas where we've got certain curricular issues or, or problems that we want to track, uh, as well as kind of sort of, we say, obvious places like the award winners and honorifics that the people tend to think of them. I tend to think of it as, like I said, new focus and old problems things that we've been trying to, to work on for a long time. I've seen some success at badging, helping these things, like following learners over long, complicated paths of learning. Um, I do that with faculty, and one of our sort of goals with the professional development network, faculty tend to come through our uh, learning about every four years. Well, that's been almost like a new experience every four years, and we have sometimes faculty that have been through it five, six, 10, 15 times over their 30, 40 year career. And we would like to make that a more continuous experience. So potentially badging to help skill development and maintain that helps you know, provide them with sort of a unique path through what they're interested in for, 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 for professional development. Um, but it also gives us a really interesting interface to be able to watch all that happen, you know, to be able to see where skills are being developed and where interest is uh, needed and where we can develop um, other things. Um, how do we encourage systematic, intentional professional development for faculty and students, you know, by both sort of the carrot and the stick? How do we get them involved? How do we let them know what's available? And how do we encourage them to keep learning? Um, that's something, again, the badge pathways have been very helpful in doing. And something, again, as an instructional designer, I really like the sort of low impact on the technology. These are pretty easy to set up for people. It's, it's not hard to create a badge. It's not hard to create an issuer. Uh, it's not hard to integrate it uh, technologically into the Canvas course, for instance. What really takes time is the instructional design part, the outcomes, what do you want to do with it? How will it be used? Who's gonna be doing the assessment? All those kind of really interesting questions that badging has also helped us think about. So again, that's sort of my quick sort of big overview of Virginia Tech. I did see some questions sort of going through there. Um, anything I can answer real quickly but, and then we'll let Amanda move on. Yeah, thank you, Mark. It looks like um, two folks wanted to know, Rich and Angela asked if, have you ever sequenced badges in Badger with third-party badges? In other words, badges not created at Virginia Tech. I have not, but I have been looking for that opportunity. <laughs> so that's, I, I have seen that done. And I actually think what we're about to get into in our next year, where we begin to work more with undergraduates and graduate programs, uh, have that opportunity in a lot of times of these uh, out external educational programs that we may be also to offer credit. Uh, I've been looking at some, I'm interested, we, we require our professional development cycles to take a cybersecurity course, and we have some options on campus, but I, I've been thinking that might be a really good uh, uh, way to sort of leverage some external badges into that. One of the things I really like about the badger system is it makes it very easy to, to track both badges we create at Virginia Tech and badges people earn in other institutions. If we can credit them, then they can see them. Um, I just saw it's Badger specific to Canvas. No, it's not specific to Canvas. Again, one of I think of the strengths of Badger. I have several programs that do not use Canvas. They work mostly in face-to-face -face workshops. And so they will, do, they're like extension agents and they'll deliver training to a face-to-face -face group. They use only the VT Badger interface to, to award badges and encourage faculty to go in there, or, or I'm sorry, like, like community people to go in, create an account and start uh, their badging. Um, so yeah. Um, are there any other, I think we got the questions that were out there. I just wanna ask if there were any others. Oh, any badges created by student government groups or clubs? Yeah, actually, um, let me go back. I think it's back once. Oh, 
my pictures. This is my latest one that I'm kind of interested in, in seeing where they go. Um, they started just a few weeks ago and have already given out almost 100 badges uh, quickly. That is a student uh, interest group investment group. And so it's one of those where they use real funds and so they, they do investment. But this is the educational path of skill development that they have sort of li lined out in a Canvas course for the students. And they like to compete between themselves to see how many they get. So they've already built like five really quickly different types of skills like primed for the market is, is one of them. Um, and they've, I've noticed students getting them and they're doing it to do a little bit of internal competition with the student group on you know who gets the best sale, probably the biggest profit turnaround and things like that. So it could be fun. It's an interesting way to gamify student groups for sure. It looks like we got two more questions and then we'll probably transition over to Amanda and take more questions at the end. Does that sound all right? Um, so Kelsey asked, if someone wants to issue a badge, do they need to go through an approval process like faculty governance? And sort of related was, I'm not sure if this came up at Virginia Tech, but curious about how using standards for quality or difficulty in relation to awarding badges translates across the diverse topics. That is a great question. And again, I think that's something that we are going to have to be maturing quite a bit over this year. Um, the VT Badger, which I let me actually really quickly, I will put the, I don't know why I didn't, this actually came up about a month ago, we've opened our, or what they call the Badger portal for Virginia Tech, the VT Badger. That is our official Virginia Tech platform area. Um, we have been working with the library talking about Badger for more than a year now. And we've talked mostly about best practices so that as we meet different groups that want to do them, we sort of convey those best practices to them. I like the way that Badger has itself set up because if there is an official Virginia Tech group, such as Cooperative Extension, University Libraries, what Amanda's gonna show you today with you know, undergraduate research, we can move them into the official Virginia Tech area. And they do get, when a badge is issued, it says uh, at Virginia Tech is attached to the actual badge. For those, we are in the process of uh, developing a badging council of people, again, not to control it, but to determine sort of best practices on, you know, graphic elements. We have, you know, university, uh, university right, uh, in there as well, uh, as well as sort of how we want to go. Nicely though, I have encouraged a few groups to, you can go to badger.com yourself today, create yourself as an issuer, and you as an individual are the one giving these badges out. Uh, I have two classroom instructors who just wanted to gamify their classroom a little bit, and they wanted to give out like writing awards and things like that. Uh, for them, I encourage them not to be moved into the official Virginia Tech area, but to just do this badging on their own within the context of the course. Can still be integrated into Canvas very nicely and very easily, but they're not official ones. So that those questions about quality control and standards, I think those are really important for institutions and organizations to think through. We're gonna be developing sort of a best set of practices if one wants to be included in the official Virginia Tech area. Um, but as of right now, you know, the, the, these are the ones that I'm showing you here on the screen. Um, they've all sort of worked with us to help develop all that, so. It's good questions, very important. Great, well, thank you, Mark. I think yeah. we're gonna transition our time over to Amanda and then we'll have time for more questions at the end. So Amanda, the time is yours. Thank you so much. And I will go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Are you all able to see my slides okay? All right, thanks so much, Mark, um, for taking the time to kind of introduce us to badging here at Virginia Tech and what that landscape looks like. Um, so what I want to share with you all today is thinking about as a librarian, what does it look like to work on library and university wide programs and to integrate badging into those. Um, so it could be that you are currently working with existing programs or maybe you're going to be creating programs after seeing this. Um, so hopefully this will be really helpful to that. 
Um, as you can see at the bottom, I also have Anne M. Brown's name there. Um, Dr. Brown and I have worked really closely on creating these programs and on this original presentation. So I just wanted to make sure I give a shout out to her for her great work, because um, I want to make sure that she is noticed for that too. Um, so one of the first things that I wanted to think about is how do we get that student buy-in for co-curricular library programs? Um, and so in the two examples that I'm going to share with you today, we're going to kind of cover what that looks like and what does that mean. Both of these programs were created in university libraries and launched prior to that integration of badging. Um, but well-designed programs, as Mark, I think, kind of hinted to and talked about a little bit, was that when you integrate badging, if that, if that program is well-designed, if you've got goals, you've got outcomes, you're already assessing, this tool is just helping you as an administrator kind of work through that and really as a way to kind of celebrate student success, give them little awards along the way. Um, so I think that can be really, really helpful and help to serve as one of those carrots um, for students. But hopefully you'll see that a little bit more clearly as we, we get through the two presentations. So the two programs I'm going to talk to you about today are the Undergraduate Research Excellence Program, which I often call UREP, and the Advanced Research Skills Program, ARS. Um, so looking at UREP, this is a university-wide discipline agnostic undergraduate research program, and it was really designed to serve as an umbrella program for other co-curricular experiences that were taking place in the library and on campus. So as something that really was meant to motivate students to complete it. Um, and I think just really thinking about, you know, what happens next. So you do some library workshops. What's the next step? How do I get involved? And so this leads from libraries or other units to that university's Office of Undergraduate Research and ultimately to graduation. Um, the second program, the Advanced Research Skills, or again, ARS, um, was an undergraduate co-curricular program that was actually designed by librarians at Virginia Tech before I arrived. Um, and now I coordinate that. It's changed quite a bit since its start. Um, but that really is the workshop series that librarians are putting on um, to help students prepare for the end of semester symposium and also just for formal research experiences. So it's both for students who are involved in research or maybe for students who aren't involved yet, but know that they want to be. Um, again, these two programs go hand in hand. Um, ARS was built four years before UREP. Um, we've been six years in now, so I've had both of them for, for six years now. And for us, digital credentialing was one way that we motivate students, celebrate their successes, but also to help really me, document and mark students along the way because I've got, between the two of them, I've got hundreds of students enrolled. So how do you know once the students completed one that they've actually enrolled in the other and it was a lot of manual labor? Um, so for me, badging also just helped on that administrative aspect of the programming. So just to kind of describe the programs a little bit more, um, UREP again is that program for undergraduate students of any major to connect with resources and support. And so ultimately we want them to receive recognition for their well-rounded engagement in undergraduate research. The overall programmatic goals are that students are gonna track their undergraduate research journey, including trainings, validate their experience through recognition of the research efforts and achievements, and showcase their experience for potential employers and professional or graduate schools. So those are the programmatic big picture things of UREP. And then if you wanna look at what this programmatic model looks like, um, we actually have three stages that you can see here, explore, engage, and scholar. Explore is that introduction and education aspect of the program early on in a student's career. This is where the exposure happens. This could be workshops, it could be introductory classes. So that explore phase is where we see my ARS, those workshop programs, that's where that falls. It's also, I teach a four credit class. Um, it's called Introduction to Research Practices. So if a student wanted credit, it actually counts towards this program too, and some other undergraduate research intro classes. Um, engage is where the student's actually conducting research. This could be research courses for credit. Um, it could be students working in a lab. It could be a summer research experience like an REU. And that's just to name a few. And this could be something that the student is doing within the library. So Dr. Brown that I mentioned earlier, she actually has 30 undergraduate researchers. So it's possible that your library has formal research experiences, or it could be that they're doing this research again in those REUs or somewhere else. Um, so it just depends on, on your research landscape at your institution. Um, and then lastly, scholar is where the student is disseminating that research. So this is where they're thinking about presenting, publishing. It might be that they're using um, their work to upload it into your digital repositories. 
Um, maybe they're even attending national conferences like NCUR. So it just depends. It could be regional conferences with a faculty member. It, it looks, again, a lot of different ways. Um, but that's where that dissemination is happening. And so this three-tier design was created because every student needs a well-rounded experience, but we, again, understand that it looks different across the university. Um, and ideally, the student could enter this program at any point in their undergraduate career, but the earlier they enter, the more likely it is that they'll complete the full program and get that full badge and the graduation court at the end. So we really do encourage them to sign up early on. Um, and again, with these three stages, we actually have five parts that students are doing that training, conducting, disseminating, mentoring, and I didn't mention the reflecting, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and so this is what the student view looks like, um, just thinking about the program as a whole. And so what you can see in the student view is you see the three stages that I mentioned, explore, engage, scholar. And you see that there's not a straight line or a single path there. And that again is to recognize that this journey looks different across the university. And then that gray circle around everything is reflection. And because we see reflection happening at various points and throughout their research journey, we wanted to make sure that it was encompassed throughout the program. And in case you have questions about the theory behind the programmatic design, um, we did use Kolb's cycle of experiential learning as a way to kind of think about framing the undergraduate research excellence program. That concrete experience you see at the top we see that taking place probably during the training aspects. So if a student's doing a workshop or a workshop series or taking a class, that could be the concrete experience. Reflective observation, again, is going to happen between each thing that they do, but hopefully after that class, before the next thing. Um, and this could lead the student to that abstract conceptualization, where maybe the student takes a mock proposal they developed in a workshop or a class, and they seek you know, a formal experience with a mentor. And so that would move to that practical application um, where they might be working one on one with a mentor. And ideally, we see for UREP that for each stage, the student is going to work through this full cycle multiple times um, with that reflection being hit on each major stage. So thinking about the second program we're talking about is the Advanced Research Skills or ARS. Um, and the goals of this, remember, this is that co-curricular series that was designed with multiple workshops that students doing research would need. Um, and so those goals for that program are number one, they're going to explore the role of ethics, organization and best practices when working with research and data and information. They'll hopefully identify potential faculty mentors and practice drafting emails to actually reach out and connect with the research position. Um, and lastly, design an effective poster highlighting newly developed skills from the series, um, thinking that students will need to develop those posters um, further on when they're doing formal research as well. To give you an idea of the actual workshop titles that we do, we do using data ethically, managing and organizing data, managing and organizing information, writing successful proposals, sharing your research, and becoming a researcher. So thinking about how we deploy these programs and then that integration of badging, because we're all here to talk about the badging, um, both programs right now, when we started ARS, it was actually offered in person. Now, um, of course, with COVID, we're offered fully online. Um, Post-COVID, we're going to have it both ways, where the student can take it in person or online. Um, but right now, it is six modules that are all in Canvas with assessments. And then students will earn a little micro badge for each workshop, and then they'll earn a final badge when they complete all six. And then for UREP, um, which again is also in Canvas, that's five modules, no assessments. And so UREP is where the student is uploading proof of their participation in undergraduate research for each section and then the administrators, which is me, and then also the director of the Office of Undergraduate Research will go in there and check. I check the library things. She checks the other research things for verification for each um, section. So that training, conducting, um, all of those sections, that's where they get a micro badge after each section. Um, and then the, a final badge is awarded at the end. Um, and when they get that final badge, they earn that graduation cord as well. Um, and so just as a reminder, UREP itself isn't really training experiences that we're doing, but rather we're just giving students a pathway to follow to recognize, you know, what it means to be a well-rounded researcher. And we're giving them little awards along the way because they're in UREP probably um, three to four years, whereas ARS they'll probably take in a semester or a summer. So it's just, again, kind of giving them that little nudge that you're doing great, keep going, here's the path forward um, is what we're using that for badging. Um, to give you an idea what our badges look like, um, here's what you can see on the screen. The larger one on the left is our final badge, which is UREP Scholar. 
And you can see the logo there is Office of Undergraduate Research. So even though we developed this program collaboratively and largely in the library, um, it is housed in the Office of Undergraduate Research because it really is highlighting a well-rounded experience, which what is what their office supports. It's a very collaborative experience. Um, and again, in, in badging for UREP, the students actually only have to earn four of the five badges, so they don't have to complete all of them. Um, and the reason that we did that is in undergraduate research, we have dissemination there as, as one of the things we want students to do. But sometimes during formal research, students are part of a larger project. And maybe that faculty mentor isn't ready to publish or share that research yet. And so we added in mentoring as a way that maybe a student is going to work with you know, an undergraduate research publication, or maybe they're gonna serve as an ambassador for an office. So there are different ways that a student could mentor in relation to research, still earn four badges, still get the graduation cord, because we didn't want the student to not be eligible in the event that they just weren't allowed to share their research. So it's again, being mindful of what you can do to make this program work for students, um, I think is really, really important. Um, thinking large scale, how many badges have we given out so far? So we just piloted ARS and UREP this past spring for the first time. Um, and then I did ARS as well in the summer. So it is not in all of my cohorts. I have uh, a cohort for every graduating semester for UREP. So we have hundreds of students. I wanna say like 900 or so enrolled right now. And then ARS we offer only in the spring and the summer, but then it's also taught um, in, embedded in classes in research labs as formal training. So we really just did it in my summer cohort, in my spring cohort, and then UREP was just graduating seniors. Um, and so far we gave 65 badges from UREP in the spring, and we've given 1,259 badges for ARS from this summer and the spring combined. Um, so we've, we've given a lot, but I think we have a lot to go, a lot, a lot to ways to think about what this is gonna look like. Um, but overall thinking about how badging has enhanced the programs, I think for UREP for students, the most important part of this is that it's allowed students to see their stage in the program. What have they completed? What's next? Because if you're enrolled in something on Canvas for three or four years and you don't see the pathway, what they were seeing was the different modules with little assignments. And so it was hard for them to gauge looking at you know, the grade book. It was hard for them to know where they stood because each thing is worth certain points. And if they did like one thing here and one thing here, that score didn't mean anything to them, right? It only meant something to us as administrators. So the badging allows us to give them a check when they finished and see where they are, where they're going, see that full pathway. So for them, you know, it hasn't been them reaching out and saying, you know, where am I at? You know, how much more do I have? Now they have a very clear picture. So that's been great for them and for us. Um, and then for me, it's just saved hours and hours of work thinking about, you know, who's done ARS, who did a couple of workshops, who did all of it, where are they at? Because I do all of the managing and, and scoring of that. Um, so for me, once they get that, you know, ARS badge, it automatically feeds to UREP very, very quickly. Um, so it just took out the manual labor. Um, for ARS, I think it's been really nice because sometimes we have students that want to do some of the workshops, but not all of them, because maybe they've taken some of them in person in a class, maybe they've already attended some. So it allows them to do one or two and still get points towards UREP if they want, or do the whole thing and get the big badge. So I think for them, it's just been nice to kind of see the program as a whole and be able to pick and choose what makes sense for them. Thinking about upcoming badging goals, Mark and I were actually just talking about this. I'll be doing ARS and UREP in the spring, this spring, and hopefully we're gonna be doing a bigger rollout. Um, I think some of the biggest things we wanna think about, um, probably not by spring, but for the upcoming year, is, you know, are we at a place where maybe we can remove the scoring? We've got the badges in place. We see that they're working. So maybe those points are no longer as important as they were. Um, thinking about expanding ARS. Right now, ARS has one. It's not even a pathway. It's just like one set of workshops. But we're really thinking about an intro portion to that. We're also thinking about a non-STEM version of ARS. So maybe having multiple pathways where there's an intro and then students can select a STEM or a non-STEM or an intro version would be really, really great. Um, and then also just integrating badging and pathways into all of our ARS offerings. So in all of the curricular classes that it's in, all of the lab experiences, having all of those things connected, um, that way when and if those students enroll in UREP, it all feeds in beautifully, I think are, are the big things we're thinking about um, moving forward. And maybe the last thing that I didn't put on here is thinking about um, a need to develop some educational materials and explain to students, you know, what does this pathway mean? 
um, just making sure early on they understand how to read the pathway, they know what it means. I think that can be really great, especially for first year students. Um, so maybe adding some of that um, educational stuff into it, I think is something that Mark and I will probably collaborate on um, for this spring as well. So I have our email addresses up there, but we've got plenty of time, about 18 minutes left. So I think I can stop sharing, um, but Mark and I are both gonna be here and we're happy to discuss this. If we wanna look at things, answer questions, we're open to all of that. Great, thank you, Amanda. It looks like we have quite a number of questions coming in on the chat. So I, um, I'm gonna catch them in order and, and give them back to you, but thank you to okay. both for sharing your experience with us and then being so willing to answer a lot of questions that are coming in. So the first one um, might have been still back to probably Mark's presentation, but I'm just going to put it out there. Any tips on communication strategy around the sandbox approach so that safe play instances don't interfere or dilute the official credentialing efforts? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this and, and probably the best thing I can recommend is a stakeholder group, right? So that's something that I think we got right this time that we hadn't done when in the previous year ones where I was doing it, it really was just me and Telos trying to push it out there. I think early on, I had partners like Amanda and Shelly, you know, and a couple of people who were making official programs, but were exploring my <laughs> the exploring and then really the three of us being able to communicate how it's working where it goes out started becoming really effective then i you know really we've got a standing meeting with the library now uh, my next goal in the new year is and i'm loosely calling it like a badging council i really want to get the stakeholder group together because they are the ones that are going to be communicating this you know those the differences between an official polished badging program that's out in, you know, in the public for Virginia Tech. And then what I also feel like a big part of my job is, which is encouraging play and practice and sandboxing and trying to figure out if it fits into your English course too, you know, like all of that. So yeah, I'm hoping that that's really what this year is. Um, yeah, I think Amanda pointed to some of that in her talk right at the end too, like building resources for students to even understand what it means <laughs> when we're talking about them. Um, those are some things that I'm hoping like a stakeholder group could invest in, you know, like the, not me or Telos, but lots of us because we share that, um, you know, defining what pathways are and uh, that VT Badger portal I shared with you how we can use that to encourage some of these things you said, like how do people even know this program is available? Like some of those kind of languages about um, that. So again, I, I think communication, I, I've been fascinated with badging, you know, coming out of technology and out of instructional design. It's definitely an instructional design strategy. It's also a marketing <laughs> tool. Like you really have to think about branding and marketing and communication strategies because that's what they're there to help with. Um, so good questions. Thank you, Mark. Um, Rich asks, have you done any surveying to ask students what benefits they feel like they get out of the undergraduate research excellence program, for example, or is it a co-curricular program with the English department as a partner? Yes, um, so I actually, so with the undergraduate research excellence program, our partner is the Office of Undergraduate Research, and we did survey students in the spring and overall, students said what we hoped they would say. They said that they found it really helpful um, to tell them where they were in the process of undergraduate research and seeing themselves as a whole researcher. So like, it helped them make decisions on like what types of experiences they should be looking at. We also saw that it encouraged students to present at conferences that they wouldn't have done without it. Um, and then also just students in general said that they felt more comfortable talking about themselves as researchers because they maybe didn't see that until like we require them at that end of the program to write a full reflection about how this process has changed and how you see yourself as a researcher and maybe how you'll communicate that. And students said that they actually found that helpful. Um, so I was really excited about that. We did the survey just in the graduating class, but we're going to be deploying the same survey in all graduating classes moving forward now. So hopefully in maybe like three years or so, we'll have a bigger sample, but this year um, we, we did it just with the graduating class. Great, thank you. Um, Michelle asks, do you think there's a way to automate the administrative tasks for the badging program, i.e. who has completed which training? Yes, 
Um, so how I have it set up and Mark might be able to answer this a little bit more, but basically like you get to go in like in canvas and you can say what will trigger that batch. So it could be like as soon as a student completes an assignment, it could trigger to pop up automatically. Um, so for it's different for you rep in the sense that I have a little assignment that says like completed version and the re reason we put a little assignment there is that there's not one set way it's not just like a quiz students would take for training they would say like they might submit a snippet of a transcript to show they took a credit class or they might um, show the certificate from ARS or the badge from ARS. So because there are multiple assignments in there, I manually trigger that. But in ARS, I don't have to manually trigger it because they do the quiz and then the badge is there. So it depends how you set it up. Can I, I will jump on Go that. Ahead. Looking, Dom Purcell just asked that question about scaling authentic assessments. <laughs> right as you were talking, it was making me think of that. Um, I think it's one of the things I'm, again, I'm hoping to see more of this going, but you mentioned that you collect transcript pieces. Um, I know a lot of my other groups now, because I can do badge awarding, automatically awarded based on Canvas rules that we can set up, people are having students write, you know, they can have them, you know, put in a final statement about the program and collect that. They're, you know, they're collecting different kinds of evidence of the learning which again, like that's one of the most exciting pieces for me is that we're not just only basing this on quizzes. I still have you know, plenty of folks who do have quiz outcomes for their certification programs and some of them are quite formal quiz testing things um, and that's great and, I, and I'm glad those are there, but I, I've seen this other sort of growth and where like what Michelle Duramo in our Office of Inclusion has been doing is mostly trying to encourage conversations about diversity and inclusion around campus. She gets them to go through to get the badge. They just have to make a statement about it, which means they have to write. You know, And so that has given her a lot of interesting writing from faculty. And that is still automatically, as soon as they submit it, triggers the awarding of the badge. And so it kind of helps her scale up the get the award out there, but help me collect all this interesting information. So it's great questions. And again, well, some of the interesting areas. And I could add one more thing to that too. So for ARS, when we offer it co-curricularly, we do quizzes because it's co-curricular. We wanna make sure that the demand isn't too high for students. But when it's integrated into lab experiences, for example, we actually have students doing the actual thing. So like if they're designing a poster, they're going to submit the poster they designed that's going to the symposium. So depending on the experience that it's embedded in, the assessment does look a little bit different, um, which makes sense because the lab experience, often the student is getting credit for in a class, so we can require a little bit higher yeah. of you know work, so. Great, and that sort of answered one of the upcoming questions, which was, could you describe the assessment for ARS and what sort of activities do the students need to do, attendance or graded assignments? Yes, um, so what I do with ARS, um, they are, it's not necessarily attendance because it's all online. They submit, they can view the materials and work through them anytime. And I basically leave it open. So each week I launch a module and then they have until the following week to complete it, which I'm very loosey goosey about because um, it's co-curricular. So like a lot of times if I just leave it open, even though I encourage them to complete it. Um, and that is especially useful, I think, during like the middle of the semester where students get busy. Sometimes I'll start getting emails where like, Miss McDonald, I fell behind. Can I still do this? And I'm like, of course. Um, so I do kind of am loose on that. But in terms of thinking about how I scale it, it's basically like complete incomplete so for scoring that scaling, I mean. So like if the student submits something in my co-curricular thing, I it's completed. And then if it's like not really quite right, then I can like leave comments. So for example, the citation manager one, they're leaving me screenshots. Um, so it's not necessarily like a quiz that has a right or wrong answer. And so they get a complete incomplete. But sometimes like I'm looking at it and I'm like, this isn't your library in Zotero. <laughs> like that is not what this picture is of. And so I'll leave like comments if I need to or like tell the student to email me if they have questions. So I do that as well. But if the student attempts it in a workshop, it's completed. Um, so I try not to be a stickler. And how many hours are uh, is each workshop? 
Um, so the total program we say is about 12 to 15 hours, depending on where the student is doing it. If it's in a lab or, you know, if they're doing a co-curricular, it's probably about an hour, hour and a half to go through all the materials and do the assignment co-curricularly. And it could be longer if they're doing it in the lab, like designing the poster, they'll probably spend a lot more time on. But again, it makes sense because they're actually presenting it in that context. Sure. Um, Amanda asks, how do you promote UREP and ARS? In what ways and channels do students find out about the programs? Yes. So I do a couple of things. So I um, sit on the Office of Undergraduate Research's advisory board. So I send newsletters out to the entire advisory board. Each, um, each college at Virginia Tech has a, one seat on the advisory board. So I share it with all of them. I also share it with our academic advisors. I have marketing that goes out on Canvas that goes to all students and all faculty. And then I also promote it with our liaisons. So the liaisons usually send welcome letters at the beginning of each semester. So I also do write-ups and say, hey, would you mind sharing this? So I do like all of the marketing myself and then I send it out. But I really do a lot of that in terms of thinking about where it's going. I would say we used to in the past, like they have like table cards and the student cafeterias and stuff. And so in my survey for ARS, I was asking students how they found out. And it seemed like 85-ish percent of students signed up because a faculty member told them to. So I really hit the faculty hard. <laughs> and I do it through the librarians. I do it through their advisors. I do it through um, the their uh they're a person on the board, the advisory board. So I really hit the faculty harder than I do the students. Um, but the remainder of them, it seemed like came from Canvas. So Canvas was the one that the students saw, but most of them signed up because a faculty mentor or advisor told me I should. So. Do the students, um, Lynn asked, do they need to complete the various workshops in a particular order? Yes and no. No, they don't. Um, on my end, they don't necessarily need to complete them in a particular order, and you could take it just as a one-off. So there's not like an actual step-by-step -step process that you couldn't do one if you didn't do the one before, but how I launch it encourages them to do them in that order, basically, because I only show one per week. Um, so most students complete them in that order, and if they fall behind, they still finish in that order. Um, now this semester I'm doing it different for the first time and I'm actually going to show it all at once. Um, and the reason is, is because it seems like students fall behind once they hit like that midterm part of the semester. So I want to see, I don't know, it, it, either A or B is going to happen. Either A, they're all going to, they're going to have more people complete it because they're going to do it fast and do it right away, or B, people are going to think they have all semester and less people are going to complete it. So we'll see. Um, I'm not sure if it's, I hope it gets a good idea. It might be a bad one. But I do encourage them in the past based on when I released it, but they don't have to complete it in that order. Great. And Amanda, are the workshops um, synchronous or asynchronous? Depends how they're offered, but right now they're doing it synchronously. But okay. it's possible, like if they did it in the summer, we did them in the summer asynchronous. So. And how, how are the ARS modules embedded into Canvas? Are there any concerns about FERPA in terms of students' personal data? Um, etc. There are no concerns about FERPA that I had to guarantee before I was allowed to do it. So I can assure you there, there, there aren't concerns. Um, so it is embedded into ARS. So I have actually, now they're not curated. So if you were interested in doing ARS at your institution, definitely send me an email. I can kind of give you the whole program. So, but the individual objects are all in the university's digital library, digital repository called Odyssey. And so those are all like little videos. I have some PDFs, I have some readings, but they're structured just like a normal Canvas course where I have the module. I have a module at a glance, which tells each student at the beginning, like this is what you're gonna do in this module. You'll watch these things, you'll read these things, you'll do these things, here's the due date. Um, but it's all just embedded like you would embed normal course materials, mostly videos, um, but we do have um, slide presentations that they can click through case studies, um, guides, things like that. But I have all of that in Odyssey and it all has open licensing. So if you saw things and you liked it, you could change it, you could use it as is. If you want the whole program, I can share that with you as well. 
Thank you. Um, we had two questions that were kind of related. The first is, are the reflections graded as completed or not completed? And if not, how is the grading done? Which also leads into any thoughts about scaling authentic assessment of submitted evidence? Yes. Um, so depending how the student takes it depends how I grade it. If you take it as a co-curricular workshop, I grade it complete incomplete, but I might give you feedback. Um, but I don't, I'm not too picky. If you take it when in my class, like I have it embedded in my class and other people have it embedded in their classes or labs, then we actually have a rubric that goes along with the assignment and there are specific expectations and I score using the rubric within Canvas. And I think there was a last part of the question that I didn't answer. Yeah, and I know Mark touched on it a little bit, but um, he might have some follow up thoughts. It was about um, scaling authentic assessment for um, for the badges. Yeah, so the scaling of that, I guess it would depend on what's going on. So the grading for ARS in some ways depends how the students get it. So I do a lot of overseeing of that. So like I probably, I don't know, I would be, I don't know that I could, I would have to have people helping me score. So we would probably have to have a team of people or maybe if I was embedded in a large class or something, maybe that instructor would help me, but I would be scared because like, Thinking of numbers, I had 291 students take ARS in the summer. Um, and so that would be, I, I mean, I, you know, also a faculty member, so that would be a lot of scoring. And then if I look at like the reflection essays that we submit to UREP, I have about 900 students in UREP alone. So if they were doing, you know, actual assignments for six modules, in ARS and I had 291 students, that would be 291 times six. And then if I turned around and they were doing UREP, they would have to do that final reflection. I mean, that would be a lot of grading. So I would think at that point, like right now I have uh, the director of Office of Undergraduate Research and her office assistant and me are doing the bulk of the scoring. And I would think if we need, if we wanted to do authentic assessment, which I do believe is very important. And I think it's really telling, um, I think you would probably, depending where you were integrating it, you would probably want to partner with the faculty member in that class to help you with the scoring. Um, and then that would make it doable is what I would say is really rely on your partners work together about making sure you're evaluating students work in the same way. So that, you know, one student isn't getting, you know, a check mark from the librarian, but like a non pass from the faculty member or something, you want to make sure that you're both on the same page on your expectations and that the students know those. Um, but yeah, for me, I think it would be hard if I were just doing it on my own, it would be hard. But that's what I could see is is really partnering yeah. to help with that. And I don't know if yeah. Mark has more. Oh, oh, I was gonna say it's actually noon and um, I oh, don't sorry. go over too far. But I, I think Emily has a wrap up. But I wanted to say thank you, Amanda and Mark. Sorry. Thank you. All. Yeah, yeah um, thank you so much to our two presenters, uh, Mark and Amanda, um, and to all our participants. This has been great engagement in the chat. Um, so we thank you for all of that today. And as I just posted, we will be emailing the recording out and posting it to the lib guide that I put a link to in the chat. So you can check it out there if you came late or want to pass it on or anything like that. Um, just really quickly, we will have a spring webinar that will look very much like this on a different topic. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you have ideas or topics you'd like to see us um, have a webinar on, let us know. Um, please feel free to follow with, up with us or the presenters if you have any questions. And most importantly, have a relaxing, a restorative break and a happy, healthy 2021. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you all. Thank you.